As we look to the future, we believe that levelling up is more important now than ever before. For us, this means ensuring that wherever you come from, you can access and benefit from transformational educational opportunities to help you chart your path towards putting your learning into action in your future career. At the University of Essex, we've seen firsthand the increasing challenges that students face in terms of access to education, well-being, and future opportunities. We're the lead institution for Make Happen, a collaborative partnership that includes universities, colleges, schools, and local authorities. Through Make Happen, which is part of the National Uni Connect programme funded by the Office for Students. We've been working together to support hundreds of students from areas of traditionally low participation in higher education since 2017. We make sure that students are supported with high quality impartial advice and guidance to help them to make the right choices for their futures. This has been even more important during the pandemic. We've worked with our partners to offer a range of virtual activities to develop the skills and knowledge that students need to open doors, to allow them to make informed decisions and to achieve their full potential. We're delighted to be hosting this important discussion and to continue working with the Purpose Coalition to achieve our aims. At Essex, we believe in a fair and level playing field for everyone in terms of job opportunities and life chances. We're proud to continue working with our partners to inspire change and to achieve these goals. Hello and welcome to the latest Leveling Up seminar. I'm Ian Dale. Um, we're going to have a bit of an Essex theme to the whole hour. I think every single person on the panel that comes from Essex, including me, uh, but don't let that put you off. Uh, we are going to talk about one of the Leveling Up goals on the educational front. Um, it's, the, it's the third Leveling Up goal. It's called Positive Destinations Post 16 Plus. And the aim of this goal is to ensure that every young person and adult is to have the choice of a high quality route into education employment or training and I think if you've been following the other seminars that we've done over the past couple of months you, you will know that education has featured a lot in our discussions well we're going to be talking about the routes into education the importance of uh, education in, in leveling up all across the country well let's talk, let's introduce our panel first of all Justine Greening former Secretary of State for Education Justine's with us on all of these seminars we're also joined by Professor Lorna Fox O'Mahony who is Deputy Vice Chancellor at Essex University. Ian McNaughton has been the principal at Colchester Sixth Form College since 1997. And Terry Foreman is a third year student at the University of East London studying drama, applied theatre and performance. She's a student and curriculum ambassador and recently worked with the schools and colleges team as an intern supporting the planning and delivery of outreach activity. And Julia Carr is a senior lecturer and course leader in education at ARU. So let, let's start off with um, really just talking about what we think this positive destinations post 16 plus idea is all about. Um, Julia, let's let's start with you first. You you um, uh, just explain what ARU is, first of all, because I, I didn't just now. Oh, sorry, that's Anglia Ruskin University. I thought yes, we, a couple of years ago, we shortened it. So. Right. <laughs> As everybody is nowadays. For yes, it, yes. Um, right, so so what, what does this post-destinations, post-16 plus goal mean to you? I guess for me, it means that all young children, uh, young people, no matter who they are, what their backgrounds are, where they come from, what their aspirations are, should be able to fulfil those aspirations with the help of either the education system, the higher education sector or employers. It shouldn't be barriers put in place by any of those institutions. So it, we, we should be helping everybody reach their potential. And I guess personally for me, because of my research area, it focuses on um, our young autistic population who face significant barriers either into the workplace or into continuing in higher education. 
And what are some of those barriers? Because um, I, I talk quite a lot about um, autism and, and special needs on, on my radio show. And um, we, we talk a lot about the needs of autistic children in school, but after school, it kind of, we don't talk about that so much. Oh. What are the barriers that they face? We don't, we, you're right, absolutely right. We don't talk about it. I, I think we don't talk about it enough. And I think the education system over the last, um, well, since 2014, when the, the special education needs changed significantly and there was a lot more um, support put in place, the education system does a lot better. Um, with not just with those with autism, but with, with special educational needs and disabilities in general. Um, and it, that's meant that there are, significantly more young people with autism who are finishing full-time education with the qualifications that could lead them into university but for, for a number of reasons they're not going to university or if they do go they tend to drop out at a much higher rate very early on so I think for me that understanding of the higher education sector as to how to not only support them when they're in university, but that is a big thing. Um, and uh, some universities do that a lot better than others, but there's always a lot of room to improve. But it's more than that. It, it's about helping them get to university. So making the application processes much more open, um, much more supportive, um, enabling. We had this vision that when, when our young people get to 18 and they're looking at going to university, they're adults, they should be doing this on their own. So universities don't tend to communicate very well with parents and carers. Um, and our young autistic people are not used to doing things on their own. They've had that support all the way through and they need that support to continue. So that's the higher education and the business. We need businesses to understand that if you employ somebody with autism it's a massive bonus for your company they come with they do come with um, requirements and adaptations but they also come with a huge amount of skills and a loyalty um, that I don't think business recognizes at the moment so we've heard there from Julia um, about some of the barrier or one particular barrier that there is for some people getting into uh, post-16 education. But um, Justin Green, just on the, the, the theme of positive destinations post-16, why is that such an important levelling up goal? Because I think you can put all of that effort into giving very young children a great start with strong foundation early years. They can have fantastic schooling but if they can't then connect that up with the next steps they want to take in life and work out not only what's available but how to get there and then if what's available isn't high quality in the way that they want that can also mean that even if they know the path they want to go down next it's not one they feel they can go down and so positive destinations post 16 is really about saying young people should have the right knowledge about their very different options for a long time. Many young people thought it was maybe just A-levels and that was it. Actually, the reality is there's way more options. There are some fantastic routes through um, in further education and local FE colleges. I think we're going to go to hear about what some of those are. Um, but it's also about them understanding what steps that they can then take in order to connect up to those pathways. And then finally, as I said, it's about making sure that perhaps what has been quite a myopic focus um, by the education system on an academic route um, is complemented with a really high quality vocational route. That means there's not just, if you like, an awareness of choice, but it feels like a genuinely high quality choice, whichever route you want to, whichever you, route you want to go down. That's actually a barrier in itself, isn't it? That the moment you get to the point where you have to choose whether you go down the vocational route, further education, technical education, or higher education. And I, I, I don't know what percentage of people feel that in the end they made the wrong decision, but I suspect it's a lot, it's a lot higher percentage than maybe we'd like to think. Absolutely. And, and I also think it's about getting some really good advice alongside 
what those destinations are and the choices are. You know, certainly I remember my A-levels advice was probably not the best advice that I got. And yet it directly influenced which choices I made of what subjects that directly then influenced which universities I could or couldn't go to. Because I probably picked A-levels that weren't really playing to my strong my strong sides, if you like, of what I was interested in or what I was good at. So it's about having those roots there, knowing which ones to take and then and then getting some really good advice around navigating from what's been a big part of your life up until there, then, which is schools, and then being able to work out how to make that jump into what happens post-16. Um, let's come to Lorna. Um, you're a Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Essex, a massive institution. Um, I applied to go there in 1980, or was it 81? Um, I imagine the number of students that go through your doors 40 years later are, are rather more than they were in 1980, 81. What, what are the challenges that you face as a university to helping uh, maybe some of the applicants overcome maybe one or two of the barriers that Justine has talked about? Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, outreach is a really important part of the work that we do, um, working in partnership um, with our with our feeder schools, uh, with our local schools, uh, working with colleges and working with other universities. Um, the, the work that we do with with Make Happen, uh, for, for which Essex is the lead organisation, but, but working closely with uh, across Essex universities, schools, colleges, local authorities, is really about ensuring that every student gets the opportunity to be able to chart their own path. And, and exactly as Justine's been saying, um, you know, there, there, are, there are different paths that are right for different kinds of learners. Um, and for us, the, the real power of the Make Happen collaboration is that we're working together to provide impartial advice and guidance and support and opportunities to engage in activities so that students who are coming through are able to, to have access to a wide range of potential opportunities and to have support for them to be able to, to chart their own path uh, to make the choices that are going to be right for them. I guess it's a balance here, isn't it, between what the university wants from the students that come through their doors and the advice that the student gets in the sixth form. Uh, and I, I imagine, and we'll come, we'll come on to um, Ian in a moment on this, but I imagine that the, the quality of that advice, the depth of that advice does vary a lot from school to school. So, so the model that we use in, in working in outreach is, is about partnership with schools so that we can understand what are the best ways for us to work with them. Uh, and again, schools are different and have different needs. Um, students are different uh, depending on, on their own uh, previous experiences. So, so for us, it's about understanding how to, to help support those different needs. It's not a one size fits all model. Um, the, the Make Happen collaboration is a school led model. Um, where we're working with the schools to, to figure out what are the right set of activities, opportunities, engagements in order to create as much benefit as we can for the children who are coming through. Um, Ian McNaughton, you, you've been head of colleges for Sixth Form College since 1997. You must have seen, well, you've seen a lot of education secretaries come and go. You've seen a lot of different policies come and go. How, how has the whole system of advising 16 to 18 year olds as to what they should do post school, how has that changed and how has it maybe improved? I can't actually say it's improved. I think probably in many ways it's, it's gone backwards. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, uh, the demise of independent careers guidance for young people between 14 and 18 uh, is a big issue. So, so most young people in school, when they're in years 10 and 11 now, are fundamentally dependent, I think, on, on advice from within the school. And that advice from within the school is often quite loaded. So I think that's a backward step. Um, I think the other, the, the other view is that Clearly, at the moment, there's quite a sophisticated range of options for 16 to 18 year olds. Um, I think we're heading towards that becoming narrowed, either in terms of technical and vocational pathways or academic. The whole applied routes are, uh, are in danger. And we come across so many 14 to 16 year olds and their parents who are not ready to make a very specialist decision at that stage. What they want to do is keep their options open and continue in general education up to age 18 uh, and then maybe specialise at that stage. So I think the 16 to 18 pathways 
uh, that we've had historically at the moment are, are, are look, look as if they're going to be narrowing. And I think that's a retrograde move. So what, what is preventing you from offering the, I don't know, level of advice, the breadth of, of advice that you think 16 to 18 year olds need? <clears throat> well, in, the, in this college, we do a tremendous amount of work with students, prospective students and their parents and the local schools. But, you know, we, we are talking about what it is that we offer. We are not a career service. We are not providing guidance uh, acro across the board. And, and that independent careers guidance that really uh, was in place through the 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, and indeed into the noughties, um, has, has largely disappeared. So fundamentally, most young people uh, and their parents are dependent upon the guidance given by individual providers and, and their teachers at school. So why did, why did that advice go? Well, I think that's a political decision. I, I suspect probably the expenses. I suspect it was resource cuts. And, and let's, let's face it, in terms of 16 to 18 resourcing, there have been draconian cuts since 2010, and that has had a huge impact on, on, on the landscape. Apart from the uh, enrichment funding, 16 to 18 was cut 80%. So, uh, you know, most of the funding now, 16 to 18, is there just for the qualification-based courses, and 80% cuts in partial support, welfare support, safeguarding, mental health, additionality and careers guidance uh, is, is a really, really constraining issue. So Justine, it's all your fault. You, you were part of a government that did what Ian's just accused it of. Um, I do remember um, the debate on careers and uh, I, I felt at the time that was more of a philosophical view held by um, the then Secretary of State at the DfE about um, the quality of careers advice that was being given. My view, which is what I expressed in those meetings that I was part of, um, I was at Treasury at the time, was really much more around, I didn't agree with cutting back on uh, careers advice. I actually think it's very important. Um, I think there was an issue, if, if you like, on quality, the key was making sure that you improve the quality. And I think, in a sense, the work that I've been doing in the last few years around the social mobility Pledge also recognised that one of the ways you improve the advice for young people is by enabling them to hear more directly from employers they're likely to be getting careers with outside of work. And there's a huge expectation, I think, within the education system that I think too often we expect career, uh, teachers to be able to give great careers advice when actually, you know, that's not what they do. And therefore, the key to this, I think, in is very much getting those um, employers that are going to have the opportunities outside of um, the education system to be able to come into schools and colleges and universities, of course, to talk about those sorts of uh, jobs and careers that they've got, bring them along. Um, Terry Foreman, let's bring you into the conversation. You, you've been at the sharp end of this more recently than any of the rest of us. Um, when you were at school, did you feel that you were getting the advice that you needed? And looking back, you're now a third year university student. Look at, looking back, what do you think could have been improved? Um, for me, we was actually having this conversation the other day that the services that we're providing now from the Outreach and Access Centre, I never received. And it was only kind of four or five years ago for me that I was leaving year 11 and going into further and higher education. So there is definitely room for improvement even now. So we are, as a university in East London, we're providing a lot of the schools with um, seminars on how to write your statements for the UCAS application and how it, your transition will be going into further and higher education as well. And when I first started working in the um, outreach and access center, I was like, this is great. I would have really benefited from this a few years ago. I wouldn't have just been, okay, so A levels and uni, that's my only, my only option. And there's so many different pathways, like everyone else was saying, there's so many guidance uh, routes into different um, scenarios and workplaces and things like that. It's just very important for our students now to know that there's just more than one way through um, and that's why the work that I've been doing is really really important um, just to kind of let those students know that it's not just the one straight narrow path. Yeah. Uh, 
some years ago, and I, I'm talking probably eight, nine, ten years ago, the, the, I think I'm right in recollecting, because I'm sure I discussed this on the radio, that there was a 25% dropout rate in the fir among first-year students at your university. Now, I think that has dramatically changed now, at least I hope it has, <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure it has. Um, what, what would have been instituted by the university to make sure that didn't happen again? Because in a sense, you've got 25% of, of an intake from a year group feeling that they failed. And actually, it's not their fault. They should probably never have gone to university or maybe a, a particular university. I mean, let's not just pick on uh, the University of London. This happens all over the place. And I'll come to Lorna on this in a second. But if you have at such a high dropout rate, something is going wrong in leading a lot of young people to think they should go to a university in general or a particular university. And then they find out it's not for them. Yeah, I think it's really important to come back to the point of we didn't know any better than, oh, you have to go to university to be able to get on the higher pay grade. Um, and I think now a lot of people have that option to to drop out, but with options to fall back on as well. Like, for example, my course is drama and theatre. Everyone thinks that this is a vocational course and it's not academic, um, but you get into the thick of it and it's a lot more... Um, academical than you realize and I think that kind of dropout rate has definitely decreased I don't know the percentages of what it is like now but there's definitely support for those students who may have applied to university and think actually this isn't for me we had in my course alone on my year I had three people leave within the first three months so you can kind of see a difference there in that respect but I think the university have put in a lot in place that allows you to look into what else you could actually be exploring other than just a three-year degree course. Is this a challenge for you, Ian, where you want to encourage young people to sort of reach for the stars, you want to encourage them to be aspirational, um, and, and you, you would want as many that ought to go to university should go to university but do you also do any follow-up afterwards to find out what's happened to them and, and maybe sort of look at what what the dropout rate has been among your ex-students yes we do and and in the year after they've um, they've left us we we check uh, in, in terms of not just what their immediate destination was but uh, how they're progressing uh, and and of course um we also get hisa uh, information supply that's that's a national uh, data set which really will tell us um, how, how our students have uh, succeeded uh, w w when they move on through higher education so that's helpful but you know within that context we're, 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 we're increasingly a resource very badly in 16 to 18 education and there's limits as to what we can do once students have left us so, so in that in that sense uh, we probably do more than most um, what I thought was interesting from Terry was uh, what, what she inferred of course was that many A-levels, many degree courses, have a generic skill set. And even though the focus might be English literature or history or drama, uh, the reality is that the higher order skills are actually quite similar. And again, that bears out my, my point earlier, that what, what, one of the worrying things at the moment is uh, young people at 14, 15 being made to move into quite specialist vocational and technical pathways when actually going through general education uh, would, would keep their options more widely open, let them mature and develop and keep their options open. And actually those pathways are gonna develop a good set of higher order skills, which are useful for many, many forms of work. Um, Julia, uh, when we look at uh, further education, higher education, what, what's been your experience over the past few years of how things have changed? Have, have, have you noticed a difference in dropout rates, a difference in um, maybe the, the kind of courses that people are choosing to go on? I think, yes, but there, there is a, a definite more positive aspect around dropout. And I think um, a lot of that comes from the partnership work in between schools and colleges and universities so um, when that's done well students come to us having an eye more of an idea of what university is um, we we run a lot of open days applicant days where we do taster sessions and um, to, to try and make them feel either 
that this is a fit for them or actually maybe this isn't something that they want to focus on. Um, and I think there is a lot more understanding at university that young people don't come to university as a university student. They, there's a lot that they need to be helped with when they get to us and that transition stage, that first and it's different for each, each young person. I, I was going to say six to eight weeks, but for some, some young people, that transition stage can last the whole of their first year. Um, and they need to be supported, not, not just academically. Yes, every university student needs to learn how to reference and lots of other academic skills. But also they need to a more holistic support. They, they need to be made to feel that they belong and that university is for people like, like them and to see themselves reflected in the student body around them, I think is a, is a massive element. And I do think universities are getting better at understanding that and at doing something about that. And it was interesting what you were saying there about the, the overlap in skills. I think there's now very much uh, an understanding that we need to help our students understand and identify the transferable skills that they develop because they universities can still be quite siloed so our students think they are developing education skills which they are absolutely otherwise they wouldn't go on to be successful teachers or educators um, or youth workers or all the other careers that are out there but also they learn skills that they can take with them into whatever they decide to do with their lives, whether it's when they leave us or 20 years down the line. And although we know that as, as lecturers and as university staff, we know they're developing these skills. I think one of the, the big issues is helping our students to understand that they're developing these skills and helping them to understand that they need to sell that to future employers. They can do this, but they need to tell people that they can do this because Otherwise, they're not going to reach the goals that they want to reach. Um, Laura, let's round this section off with, with you. Um, in terms of admissions, I mean, would your admissions people ever say to uh, a 17 year old, you know, actually, we, we don't think you're right for university. We think you'd be much better going in a different direction. Uh, are those conversations ever had? Should they be had? So so I think I think. Firstly, what's coming out of the conversation is that that we shouldn't be starting this advice and guidance at 17. It's it's about reaching back as early as we can in, in the student's learning journey and giving them the information, the guidance, the tools to chart their own path. So uh, as part of the process, uh, as, as, as I'm sure colleagues will know, um, students uh, write out a personal statement talking about their motivation to study, talking about uh, you know, what they're choosing to study and, and why. Um, but you know, and, and that's their opportunity to to articulate um, their choices. But but really, I think I think the answer isn't so much about somebody at a university blocking a seventeen year old who who has identified a choice that they wish to make. It, it's more about making sure that right across the system, um, that we're ensuring that uh, all uh, school children, uh, people coming through colleges. Um, have the opportunity to have access to a range of advice and guidance so that they are able to make their own choices, but, but that they're not making those choices in isolation. And, and for us, particularly um, in the work that we do at Essex, it's about being able to reach into uh, areas of traditionally low participation in higher education and recognising that um, those who come from areas of high participation, people who have parents who've been through universities, people who are embedded in a context in which your family, your friends, your neighbours, you know, people have a familiarity with, with the whole business of going to university, that that gives a real advantage uh, to those young people in, in being able to navigate um, through the choices that they're making. So, so for us, because it's so important that we're giving those equal opportunities to be able to make the right choices and to navigate your way into the path that, that you want to pursue for your career. Um, what we're trying to do is as much as possible to wrap that sort of support um, around people who, who may not be getting it in, in their communities if, if there has been less historic level of participation there. So, so it comes back to the point that uh, Julie is making around building confidence um, around a sense of belonging, around encouraging people to feel that they belong uh, in, in university, if that's the, the choice that they've made. 
in in the path that they want to pursue so you know we run programs like a first generation program uh, which is a targeted um, enrichment program for students who are at Essex um, to be able to participate in, in additional activities that, that try and replicate that, that, that advantage that children who are coming through uh, a route of, of high participation are getting uh, at home. Uh, it's why it's important that in our outreach work um, that we're reaching parents uh, and providing advice and guidance and information that's accessible to parents uh, as well as accessible to to the learner themselves so so you know it, it's it's about enabling young people to be able to see the opportunities that are there in front of them and um, to be able to know what they need to do in order to aim for those opportunities what grades and qualifications are best going to support them uh, towards the path they want to take uh, in encouraging them uh, to pursue those paths um, where, where those are the choices that they want to make. And then once they are um, transitioning into university, uh, making sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that students from every background are getting a fair and equal level playing field uh, and opportunity to succeed. And just on that, I, I don't know what percentage of students you have that would be described as local, maybe live within, I don't know, 10 or 20 miles of the university. But I suspect that, I mean, we're concentrating this discussion on young people, but obviously levelling up uh, applies to everybody. And I suspect there are probably quite a few potential mature students who live local to a university who might go to that university if they had the chance to, rather than move sort of 100, 200 miles away. Um, are, is that part of what's integral to the, this process of providing um, as, as many opportunities as, as one can to people in the local group? Because you, you look at everyone thinks of Essex, I think, as quite a prosperous uh, county, and it is in many ways. But there are pockets of complete deprivation where I suspect that virtually nobody has ever been to a university. You look just up the coast for you, from you um, in, in, in near Clacton. I mean, there are some very, very poor areas there is that something that you target at all uh, yes absolutely and, and and i think especially in the last 14 months um what we're seeing is is you know people really thinking about where the opportunities are for them to reskill and um, many people have been badly affected by the pandemic uh, in terms of their employment and will be looking at, at where there are opportunities to to reskill or to to develop new skills to pursue other paths so, um, you know, particularly, we've seen a lot of interest in our healthcare courses. Uh, we've seen a lot of interest in uh, IT, digital, and data type courses, uh, particularly coming from people who are interested in 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 going in a different direction uh, in their careers. And you know, it's it's a really important issue around how um, universities can can work with government to continue to develop the kinds of programs that are a good fit for people in those situations. Um, because because it's not always about doing a, a three year undergraduate degree and mm. um, there are lots of different ways in which um, we we are building programs so that they're the right fit the right kind of of engagement for people who are in, in different types of circumstances so you know we watch with interest what's what's happening around skills for jobs and and the lifelong learning commission and and as as a university are are very keen to play our part uh, in delivering on that agenda, uh, because I think there, there's a great deal that universities can bring uh, to that area, particularly pointing into some of these higher skilled areas of national need. Let's each think of a, a maybe one or two different things that you'd like to see change in the system to really further the goals of what we're talking about today. Let, let, I'm going to let's Ian has made a powerful case for more money. I think that almost goes without saying that. So let's leave money out of this. If, if money was no object, what are the two things that you would each like to see change in the system to make sure that young people had the opportunities that they need uh, and, and that not, not so many young people felt failed by the system? Um, Julia, let's come to you first. Okay, so focusing on young people, um, because I, I'm passionate about what you were talking about just now about um, mature students, because I went to university as a very mature student. I've not been doing this, this I'm only about seven years into this career. Um, so, and I went through, I actually went through um, a local college and got an access to higher education degree. So that I'm passionate about making 
mature students feel that university is for them and that they bring something, they do, they bring something very positive to a university yeah. amateur students. But focusing on young people, um, I would like, <laughs> this is quite, this may be quite radical. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure everybody's gonna agree with me here. I would like there to be a break between school and college and university. I would like that to be funded by government. I would like every young person to have the opportunity of a year of some sort of community service that they're paid for to give them time to just take a breath after their A-levels, their deep BTECs, whatever that, because it's, it's a very stressful situation, but just to take a breath and mature for a year and really have that time to get some experience in a community, working with a community to think, actually, I think I know my, what I might want to do. And to have that time, not by themselves, but be, to be supported by hopefully a better career system, but that they're not coming straight through school and then being asked to make a decision about what they want to do when they go to university and therefore what they want to do with the rest of their lives, really, with this degree, unless they've got the confidence to step off and do something completely different. But just let them take a breath. Let them stop and stand still for a bit and see that as a really positive thing and support them in doing that, because a lot of, a lot of young people can afford to do that and that's wonderful. But the young people that we're talking about, they can't afford just to, mm -hmm. to stop for a year. And neither should they do nothing. I'm not, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about developing their, their sense of identity as a young adult, their communication skills, their work ethic, all of those things that they would develop in a community, working in a community, and then let them decide where they want to go after that. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, gap years were not de rigueur when I went to university, but I did I did do a gap year. I was uh, going to study German at UEA and I went to live in Germany for nine months between leaving school and going to university. And when I got to university, I found that I, I felt like an adult, whereas all the, all the people in my year group, to me, still seemed like children. And it, it as well as making me fluent in German, which was part of the reason, it just, it, it does enable you to mature. And I, I think that's actually a really, a really positive thing. I don't know what the, what the percentages of students who come into university now uh, do some sort of gap year, but there's very little that you, unless you just don't do anything, I mean, there's very few, I would imagine, that don't get some benefit from having that. I, I don't know what your experience, Lorna, is uh, of gap years and what your suggestion would be for changing the system. Um, I, I don't know that I could say with confidence, Ian, but but I wonder whether um, I think Julia's Julia's point around those who can afford to take gap years and those who can't uh, being key. So so it, you know it comes back to to recognizing that uh, where where we see that there's something which has a real value for young people, um, understanding where um, we need to do more in order to create a level playing field for uh, young people from from all backgrounds to be able to benefit from that. Um, in terms of things that that I would pull out, um, two things. Um, one is understanding the timeline that we need to to work to. Um, that outreach doesn't start at sixteen when you start looking around for universities. That that this is about um, the the learning journey um, and and understanding that the earlier we start um, supporting students in in these learning journeys and. And, and making early interventions to raise aspirations, especially for underrepresented groups, um, the more likely that is to be effective. And then at the other end of the telescope, um, understanding that it takes time to be able to demonstrate the impact of these interventions. Um, so, so there's, you know, from a from a kind of scientific point of view, in terms of really understanding and evaluating the impact that we're having. Uh, recognizing that uh, you know this is about supporting people in their life course, and and that we we need to resist having a very short term uh, approach. That this is about what happens between sixteen and eighteen, 
uh, because actually it starts much earlier and, and we see the impacts of it carrying on um, much further into, into people's lives and careers. Terry, let's come to you. Um, what would you like to see change? I think it comes off of Julia's point, actually, when she said it, I was I was nodding away if you if you saw. Um, and I think it comes back to that point of learning those transferable skills, because I think when it comes to your CV, you put all your skills down and oh, yeah, I've got three air levels. I've got a degree. I've got 10 GCSEs, but you never put down the communication, the um, timekeeping and things like that. Those transferable skills are so important not only to yourself, but those employers that are looking for you as well. Um, and I think that year of just finding yourself is really important. And she kind of took the words right out of my mouth, really. And it was just to, to learn who you are as a person, because even though I've gone straight from school to college to uni with no break, I've pretty much worked full time the whole time. <laughs> and it is really important. And I do get a lot of people say, are oh, you act older than you you actually are and I think that's where it comes down to me being in the real world and understanding what is actually happening and maturing like you say so I would definitely want something where for example work experience got pulled away from me when I was in year 10 year 11 bringing something like that back and put in those students in the deep end at that time is really really important for them to why, why do you say that got pulled away from you I didn't get to do it. It got taken. I don't know if it was just my school or if it was other schools, but the year above me, I saw them do it. And then when I went to do it, it was like, oh no, we're not doing that anymore. We can't afford it. Um, so, and I went to school in Essex. I was brought up in Brumford um, slash Newbury Park. And um, yeah, so I would, I always wanted to do that work experience mm. and I never got to do it. So I was like, well, I was lucky I knew what I wanted to do from a young age I've always wanted to be a secondary school drama teacher but my friends around me were like well now what do I do I've got to make a decision like you say for the rest of your life and they didn't know what to do so yeah. Ian that's a really important point isn't it I don't know if you want to pick up on that and then maybe give us your ideas for what could change. Yes I'd really like to endorse what um, Julia offered and, and, and Lorna and Terry's contribution to it so there is the government's um, review at the moment of the system of post A level qualifications, applications to higher education. And um, I, for one, would be very happy to, to, to endorse uh, a period of, of gap, uh, not necessarily a year, it could be eight months. So, if A level results were in August, starting university the following spring giving people post results plenty of time to look at their options and go and get some experience which isn't necessarily uh, a year in Germany as, as Ian did or um, you know a year nannying in, in Australia it could be working locally uh, you know Ter Terry was endorsing that and let's face it in a Covid context the nature of gap years at the moment is very very different you know most people that are not going straight on to university are probably having to look at doing voluntary work or community work or employment in, the, in their local areas. So no, I, I think that's a, re a really good way forward. In terms of the two um, uh, mechanisms that I would offer for leveling up, um, first of all, I think the one that was highlighted earlier, I think more independent guidance, really from age 14 onwards would make a big difference. And secondly, uh, I, I really think uh, counting against levelling up is the whole business of academically selecting children at 11 and at 16, and the way that really works all, all, all the way through the system. Now, uh, the levels of, of um, uh, selection have increased a lot in recent years, and I think if we're really serious about levelling up, we, we, we need to address that issue. Justine. Um, perhaps if I can pull on a, a few of the points that have already been made as well. Um, I mean, for me, I think it comes back to some of the work that Make Happen is doing and this issue of partnership, the fact that actually the more you can see that collaboration across the whole education system to really have that, as, you, as Lorna was saying, that quite independent um, view on what the, the next routes are for people, I think the better. I think in a sense, the missing piece has also been uh, businesses being part of that network of discussion around what careers look like. Um, in a way, it's one of the reasons why we steadily scaled up the career and career as an enterprise company. 
um, whilst I was at the DFE. There's a huge amount of goodwill out there, I think, from businesses and employers to be more involved in those career discussions. I think the more we can provide these sorts of models like Make Happen, like what the, the CEC is doing, I think the more we'll get involved. Um, I think the second piece for me is that choice isn't real choice unless it's accessible. And it comes to your point that you made earlier, Ian, about rural parts of Essex, for example. So, you know, it's all very well having, you know, fantastic colleges or, or programs out there for young people to, to access. But if they physically can't get to them for whatever reason, then, you know, they're likely to miss out as well. So I think it's ensuring that there isn't just smart models in place to get career advice and raise aspirations but there are genuinely ones that everyone can get to and I think if there's one thing we've learned from COVID it's just that online can work really effectively in in reaching a brand new group of people but ultimately that face-to-face -face support does matter um, in giving encouragement and confidence to pursue routes so I think you do need to look at how you can have a consistent offer, you know, wherever you are, actually, um, and, and however far away you might be from some of those, you know, more, more densely populated um, areas where there's a lot on offer anyway. And in terms of business involvement, I think that's a very interesting point that you've just brought up. Um, Julia and, and Lorna, um, how, how much involvement do local businesses have in, in your academic institutions? Julia first. Um, that's something that we've worked hard to develop quite quickly over the last two or three years. So speaking for education faculty, which is where I sit, we now have an employers forum. We meet um, twice a trimester normally um, to for, as a, a very much as a two way communication. So for them to suggest things that they think might be your skills or knowledge that they would like to see in our graduates. Um, and out of that has come a um, whole idea of graduate capitals and what that might look like for our, for our students. Um, but also for just to have a conversation about opportunities for our students and, and us and I, I think most universities have worked really hard to improve the employability service within um, universities now uh, so and that's available to our students from the minute they join until three years after they leave us so they can keep in contact and come back and get careers advice when they so like my students say who then they leave me they go on to become newly qualified teachers two years down the line they might want careers advice for the next move so that's still freely available too that those those are things that have developed from our discussions with local employers and we're really I, I work on, on the Chelmsford campus we're really lucky our, our local businesses our local employers are really supportive and and want to get engaged with us so and I, I can't say whether that would happen across the whole of the country but for us it's been a really positive experience and it's, it has helped us really develop that area of our student support. And Lorna is that the same for you because that I, I would imagine that there'll be many, many employers all over the country from big businesses and medium size as well, who may have very strong views about the, the kind of degrees that are being offered in many universities at the moment. And maybe there's always a bit of a time lag that it, it's maybe five or 10 years behind what the demand actually is. How closely in touch do you keep with your local businesses um, in, in Colchester and the surrounding area to make sure that you are offering uh, the kind of degree courses that are, are needed? Um, I mean, obviously not, not every course has got to be uh, geared towards a, a post-academic job. Um, courses are, are important as well but what what level of um discussion do you have so it's a really important part of the work that we do to support our graduates into uh, positive outcomes um, in different ways uh, depending on the subject discipline area and the sector so so for example in our health courses we work really closely with KGE, Health, Health East of England, NHS England, to, to really understand very directly the way in which um, we're preparing graduates uh, to, to meet their future workforce needs within the region. Um, other ways in which we, we work with other sectors, um, every year we host a big bang fair 
uh, which is focused on STEM careers and brings in uh, people working in, in STEM careers. And we bring uh, about a thousand 14 year olds onto our campuses whenever it's possible to do such things uh, and give them opportunities to have hands on learning and, and to hear various um, you know, opportunities and to hear directly from employers about the range of things that's available. One thing we started a few years ago, and, and it's interesting what you say about arts courses. One thing we started a few years ago was a digital arts fair, which is actually modeled on the Big Bang Fair, uh, which, which is focused on STEM, but is bringing in uh, employers, uh, entrepreneurs, people who've started up their own businesses, freelancers who are working in a whole range of digital arts careers and uh, working with the sector organizations like um, uh, Arts Council England, uh, Creative England, to, to really understand what the career pathways are uh, coming off of those types of courses. Um, and, then, and then with all of our areas, we have um, employer advisory boards. Um, so these are groups that meet about once a term um, and, and bring on board employers who, who are willing to work with us and help us um, in making sure that we're aligning our curricula um, to, to their needs, uh, helping us to to um, really make sure that we're drawing out aspects of programs and, and developing the relevant skills um, and, and giving students relevant experiences. Um, we've made a major investment in our Knowledge Gateway on our Colchester campus. Um, and, and a big part of that is about um, strengthening those links that we have um, with, with regional uh, employers uh, so that we can make those connections to give internship opportunities, to give work experience opportunities, work 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 based learning opportunities, um, it's it's absolutely core um, to what we do to help students to succeed. One of the things that's just gone through my mind listening to all of this, and particularly after what Terry said, um, I remember when I was in the sixth form in in Saffron Walden in Essex. That's the posh bit, by the way. Um, <laughs> it, it was a comprehensive school. Um, I remember going on a, a weekend residential politics course run by Essex County Council. I remember going to visit some TV studios in Chelmsford where we made a fake news program. And you look at what I'm doing now, would I be doing this had I not done those two things in the sixth form? That, I mean, Ian, that, that, these things can be life defining, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. And um, enrichment, which I referred to earlier, is such an important part of the sixth form experience. So on top of the academic uh, courses, pastoral, welfare, safeguarding, uh, student development is important. So, so, so is a, uh, an enrichment of additionality and extracurricular experiences. And just as you've outlined there, that's such an important thing. And sa sadly, the resourcing of it re really has plummeted. So actually, in places like mine, a lot still goes on, but it's done really off the back of complete teacher goodwill mm -hmm. um, because it's not funded. Um, Justine, let, let's well actually no, Terry, let, you you started that discussion in a way. Let, let's just finish off with 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 you on, on this. Um, how would you like? To, I mean, obviously, all of this costs money, and money is. I mean, given where we are now with COVID and the public sector debt, I mean, there is not going to be an awful lot of money. Is it, do you feel that um, it's almost the money's got to be found from somewhere? Other, otherwise. Uh, everyone, the, the whole country is going to suffer because people won't be necessarily uh, making the most of themselves or the most of their careers, the most of their education, if they don't have the kind of opportunities that, well, you missed out on in, in, in your, your sixth form. I, I feel that what I, happened in, the, in, what was this, 1979 or whenever it was, sort of eons ago, was absolutely crucial to my development. How can we get back to uh, the days when those sort of things were provided as a matter of course and didn't just rely, as Ian said, on teacher goodwill? I mean, it's a shame that it all comes down to money at the end of the day, because everyone here has obviously had their say on how we think it needs to change and everyone has that kind of consensus idea of that one-to-one -one support helps every single student. That trip to the TV studio influenced you to get on whatever path you ended up on. Um, and I think it's quite a big question to say how we even get back to how it was. I think it's kind of a whole group and ensemble um, task to get back towards because it's not just one person that's gonna be able to do that regardless of money, if we had that funding, it can't just be one person to make that change. It's a whole group of teachers, a whole group of educators, 
careers advisors um and we're not going to be able to do it just on our own like I said but yeah I would I would like to hope and think that we would be able to get back to that that stage of education and get into those positive destinations as as this whole seminar is called um Justine let, let's conclude with you because I, I get the feeling that this is actually one of the more challenging of the different leveling up goals can, how optimistic can you be that the opportunities are going to be there particularly for younger people um, in the way that they have been in the past or, or and do you think that there is a, a, an opportunity for them to be improved in the future? So I think it can be improved. I even think how it was in the past wasn't great. I mean, let's be honest. I, I don't think, you know, we are coming from a place where we used to be able to do this brilliantly. We never have. And I think it may be because, as I said before, we've always expected the education system to deliver everything. And I don't think it can. I think it, I think there's a genuine question about how we put schools in a better position to be able to engage and find the time, frankly for careers advice to happen, for example, and then Richmond, as Ian says, um, in what is a really busy school day. But I think however much you, if you like, make the system work, you do need employers to really be engaged, you know, as, as Lorna has said, you know, and as you found, Terry, and I guess Ian Dale as well, you know, you need somewhere to go to do that enrichment that is relevant. And it, it is about, as Terry said, all parts of the, the system and communities really being prepared to work in a much more collective way. And I think to do that at scale, and the reason why I am optimistic, actually, is I think there are models out there. I think we can see projects that have impact. I think Make Happen is one of those that happens to be really driven out of a higher education system but it's not the only one that can work in terms of connecting young people up with opportunities but I think the final point to to reflect on is one of the reasons it's hard is because it involves a transition and anytime you've almost got one bit of a system that if you like is really in the driving seat on a person's development and and if you like what they're looking to do in the future and then they are handing over a little bit to another bit of the system there's always a, a risk if you like that things drop out of the um that, that people kind of get lost and so i think that's almost a natural challenge because you have to have partnership working for for this bit to work really really effectively and i think often the different bits of the system we want to work together are so focused on what they're responsible for doing that perhaps it's not a surprise that they find it sometimes hard to then you know work with other bits of it in the way that they need to to really help young people make their their good decisions and then take that next steps but I do think it can be done and I think it's about having a collective will to if you like work together more collaboratively and effectively um, and that's I think how you have a, a route to success and yes of course um, the resourcing does need to be backed back backed up um, to make it happen but actually a lot of that frankly should be coming from businesses who need to I think play their role and many will want to in making this happen. Well, let's wrap things up there. It's been a fascinating discussion. I hope everybody's found it very interesting and learned something from it. Thank you to all of our panel, uh, Julia Carr, Lorna Fox O'Mahony, uh, Ian McNaughton, Terry Foreman, and of course, Justine Greening. Now this I think is it's either the seventh or the eighth seminar in this series on leveling up goals. If you want to uh, watch all of the others, they're available on the Fit for Purpose Leveling Up Goals website. Join us again next time. Goodbye.